Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Thanks for joining us today for our Bible study on David. We all know David was far from perfect, yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. We can learn from David how to seek restoration with our Heavenly Father through honest repentance. What God saw in David, he can see in us. We too can be people after God's own heart. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge with today's message. Good morning. Welcome to session number 12 in our study of the life of David, a man after God's own heart. I'll be very honest right up front. I want to tell you, I have been so looking forward to today's class because we are going to be examining one of the most controversial, perplexing, fascinating stories in all of the Bible, but certainly in the life of Saul and David. And, uh, It all revolves around things that we have already seen time and again in the account from 1 Samuel about Saul and David. What we have seen over and over again is the power of the unseen. David is filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment Samuel anoints him as Israel's future king. Saul, on the other hand, is possessed by an evil spirit. Now, That has garnered a great deal of attention in our culture and in this time. Because today there are many people who just simply dismiss any notion of spirit beings or demonic presence. And yet we find it not only throughout the account of David here in the Old Testament scriptures, but we find it throughout the scriptures. And it was certainly very prominent in the ministry of Jesus and of the earliest believers as recorded in the book of Acts and also in the writings of the apostles. Today, there's even a growing body of individuals who come from very secular backgrounds who are beginning to admit the reality of spirit beings. I'd like to quote from an article that appeared in a professional journal the Journal of Religion and Health, back in April of 2005. Uh, The article was written by a professor out in California at uh, California State University in Bakersfield. His name is Stafford Betty, and the title of this article that he wrote for the journal, a professional journal, is The Growing Evidence for Demonic Possession. What Should Psychiatry's Response Be? Now, in the midst of this article, Dr. Betty makes the following comment as he describes uh, demonic possession and demonic beings. He says they are, and I quote, intelligent beings, insensible to us, with a will of their own who seem to bother or oppress us, or in rare cases, possess our bodies outright. Now, Professor Betty goes on to assert that he's not talking about things that are mentioned in the Bible, of course. (laughs) I'll be honest with you. I think he does that for the benefit of his own colleagues. But in the abstract of this journal article, the following is mentioned. It says, evidence of evil spirits is voluminous and comes from many cultures, both ancient and modern. It, It goes on to say, the actual experience of spirit victims, the universal universality of spirit oppression, the superhuman phenomena associated with possession, and the comparative success of deliverance and exorcism versus psychiatry are considered in this article. It goes on to say the potential arguments against the spirit hypothesis center on the antecedent improbability of spirits, multiple personality disorder, and the effectiveness of medication. But these can be countered. Psychiatrists should question their materialist assumption that mental illness is strictly a matter of aberrant brain, carefully examine the literature of possession, and experiment to determine why exorcists and deliverance ministers often succeed where psychiatry fails. Rather fascinating, isn't it, from a professional secular journal of psychiatry? And uh, it reminds us of what we're going to be taking a look at today. And that is, we're going to see once again the power of the unseen. So let's begin with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, open our eyes to see what is unseen, to see what is invisible as well as what is visible. 
May we above all else see you, see your divine power, your creative brilliance, your unimaginable love as you show it through your son, Jesus, the Messiah, our savior and the Lord of the nations. We pray that today you would drive away all fear. You would draw us to yourself. You would fill us with your Holy Spirit's presence and power, and you would open our eyes to see that which is unseen. We pray it in Jesus name. Amen. Well, here we go. As we take a look at the story we began last week uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 28, the story of King Saul going to the medium at Endor. I'll just call your attention to the the location of all of this. The events that we are about to, to witness and experience all take place near the Jezreel Valley along what was known as the Via Maris, the, the way of the sea, one of the great highways of antiquity. King Saul and the troops of Israel had assembled on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines, on the other hand, were across the valley at a place called Shunem. Saul, during the night, had put on camouflage, basically. He had disguised himself and traveled about six miles north from Gilboa, within two miles of the Philistine camp, to get to Endor, where there was a medium. And uh, when we left off last time, we left off with Saul swearing to the medium, uh, basically uh, sinning as he uses God's name in vain. But he swore to the medium who was worried that she was going to be uh, basically put up on charges for violating the law. Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, he said, you will not be punished for this. That's from 1 Samuel 28, verse 10. And this then is what follows. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, Saul said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You're Saul. Now, what happened here? How is it that all of a sudden, in an instant, Not only does this woman see a figure, but she cries out, seemingly unexpecting what's happening, and suddenly realizes this man in disguise is actually the king, King Saul, who has ordered that all mediums be put out of the country or put to death. And then we read this. The king said to her, don't be afraid, verse 13. What do you see? Now, this is interesting because apparently Saul has not seen anything. But the woman does. The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. By the way, the word that is translated here, ghostly figure, is the Hebrew word Elohim. It is the name for God. The the Bible begins in Genesis 1, verse 1. Bereshith bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. Now, Elohim is actually a plural word. But whenever it refers to God, it's used with a singular verb. Here, however, this word for God or gods, literally, is used with a plural verb. And it's an indication from the biblical author that what she is seeing is not the true God, but is something somehow connected with with spirit beings and quite possibly with false worship. Anyway, the text goes on. Verse 14, Saul asks, what does he look like? An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Now, here again, I think it's very important that we take a look at the words that are used. And while it's not evident in our text, it is in the original Hebrew, a very interesting word that is translated robe. It's the Hebrew word me'il. And it literally means a sleeveless robe. Now, what's so fascinating about that word is it is the word that is used, for instance, in the book of Exodus to describe the robe worn by the high priest. But 
even more significant for what we are seeing here today is this is the same word, the exact same word that is used in 1 Samuel 15 when King Saul grabbed the robe of the prophet Samuel and accidentally tore it. And so what the woman is seeing here is apparently the prophet Samuel wearing the very robe that Saul had ripped. And if you recall what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, when all of that happened before David was anointed, this is what we read. Verse 27 of 1 Samuel 15, as Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, Me'il, and tore it. And it tore, actually. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. And now, that incident, which had happened many, many months, even years before, is now brought to Saul's memory as the woman describes what Samuel is wearing. And it is a reminder. God is going to fulfill what he declared through his prophet Samuel many years earlier. Well, then Saul knew it was Samuel. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 14. And he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. This brings us to one of the huge questions about this account and about things that we see elsewhere in Scripture. And that is, what is going on here? Now, there have been a number of suggestions over the centuries as to what is happening. I'd like to look at the three most common this morning and then analyze them on the basis of what we see in the text. The, the first explanation that is given for what happens here and what follows is this is a case of demonic deception. Now, we started our class today by taking a look at, at what the secular world is even saying today about the reality of the demonic. But there are many over the centuries who have looked at this and said, this may well be a case of a demon impersonating Samuel. And, and that has been a, a view that has been held by many, that a demonic being has come in and uh, taken the appearance of Samuel. And uh, that's what is taking place here. That view is widely held. I will tell you, that is not my view. And again, because the scripture does not say specifically, here's exactly what happens, uh, we have to be careful here. But I do believe the scripture says very clearly, here's what took place, and we can analyze it on that basis. And frankly, as I look at the text, I do not see indicators that this is a demonic presence doing this. It's not lying. It is not saying things that are, you know, improper or unseen or unexpressed or un, un, you know, unim, unimpeachable things that, you know, only a demonic being would know. Instead, what we have are things that come right out of the mouth of the prophet Samuel years earlier. And uh, I do believe in demonic deception. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I hold to the view of the Bible. And that is, there is an unseen realm. And I also will say, just from personal experience, as a pastor, I have witnessed personally cases of demonic possession that are not a matter of simply, well, that's your opinion. No, I, I've seen people who exhibit all of the things that we see in the New Testament, for instance, that are involved with the possession by demonic spirits. People falling to the ground, curling up in a fetal position, making unhuman noises, eyes rolling back in their heads. I've witnessed that firsthand. You may not agree with that. You may not believe that personally, but a, the Bible does teach it, and B, I have seen it. So I, I'm not denying that there could be demonic deception here, but I don't think that's the root cause of what we're experiencing in this text.
A second view is that what we have here is a medium skill at conjuring up people from, from the unseen realm. And uh, some have suggested that this woman, uh, basically using the, uh, the tools that the Bible says are improper and should never be used. We are called not to consult the, uh, the spirits of the dead. We are called not to engage in what is often called necromancy. Uh, many have suggested that what we have here is a woman who, by her own power and ability, called up a deceased spirit. Now, I want to stress, the Bible says we are not to do that. But I believe what we see in the text would indicate this woman was just as surprised as King Saul when this spirit being appeared. And that leads us to the third possibility. And this is the one that I feel is most in keeping with what the scriptures say. And that is, this is a case of divine revelation. God allows Samuel to appear to the woman and to speak to Saul and reveals what he has said all along. By the way, that is not beyond God's power. While the Bible makes it very clear, we are not to try to contact the dead we do have clear instances where the dead contact us. And the clearest example in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the transfiguration of Jesus, where Jesus is suddenly transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and standing with him are Moses and Elijah, now Moses and Elijah had been gone for a long time. Moses died. Elijah was taken to heaven, but they both appeared with Jesus. And so I do not believe on the basis of scripture that we can rule out a genuine appearance of Samuel. And so on that note, let's take a look at what the rest of the text says. We're going to pick up now in verse 15, and this is what we read. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I've called on you to tell me what to do. Now, we talked last week about the fact that one of the reasons God had not spoken to Saul by the prophets is the prophets recognized this guy's demon-possessed. One of the reasons God had not spoken to him by the Urim, by the, uh, the high priests, is that Paul had, or, uh, Saul had killed off a lot of the priests. And God has not spoken to him in dreams because Saul is living in open rebellion against God. And Samuel makes it very clear in what follows, what is to come. Samuel said, verse 16, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Isn't it interesting that Samuel, who's appeared in the very robe, apparently, that he was wearing when Saul grabbed hold of it and accidentally ripped it, he makes it very, very clear what he had said to Saul years earlier. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to one after his own heart, to David. Verse 18. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath, wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Now, I'd like to go back to divine revelation as compared to demonic deception and a medium skill. This spirit being is speaking directly to Saul and is speaking truth. 
But I would also note, there is grace in this. Saul is desperate to know what to do, know what the future holds. And God is allowing him to hear what he has already said to him years earlier. But more than that, God is basically calling him to repent. He doesn't say, if you repent, you know, none of this will happen. But what he is basically doing is saying, Saul, this is your last chance. You're going to be dead tomorrow. Come back to me. You have made the Lord your enemy, Saul. And he in his grace is communicating with you tonight. Well, what we read is that Saul was absolutely overwhelmed. Verse 20, immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing at all that day and at all and all that night. I, I would just like to, to reflect on that, if I may, for a second. This is an instance of King Saul doing the same foolish thing over and again. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 14, when Saul had been gifted by God to push back the Philistines, his son, Jonathan, had led a successful attack against the Philistines, and they were running in fear. But Saul, in foolishness, called out an oath to the army of Israel, saying, No one is to eat anything until we have taken vengeance on our enemies. And as a result, the army withered in the midst of that glorious victory. Guys need food. And Saul uttered a foolish oath. Now he's doing the same thing. On the eve of battle against a gigantic Philistine army, he has chosen to fast. And so all of his strength has left him both physically and spiritually. And I believe God, in his mercy, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, is calling Saul back to himself. And when Samuel says, you'll be with me tomorrow, you and your sons, he's saying, make sure you're really with me. Well, this is what we read next. Verse 21. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now, please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. The woman prepares feast fit for a king. <laughs> that, that's really what this is. To kill the fatted calf. Keep in mind, in biblical times, meat was not usually on the table for dinner. It was rare and special. And to kill it, a fatted calf and give it to the king truly was a meal fit for king. And again, I believe God is using even a pagan medium to call Saul out of his foolishness and back to the truth. Well, we read in chapter 29 now. The Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. Now, this is one of those verses that's easy to read over, but it gives us some very real clues about what's going on. Because what the author is doing now is he's taking us back in time. He's taking us back to days before Saul went to see the medium at Endor. And he specifically 
indicates that by saying the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek. That's a different place than what we saw as we began the study of the medium at Endor. And so to put it on the map here, the Philistines at the time of Saul's death were at Shunem and Saul was at Gilboa. But at this particular point, the Philistine army has gathered far to the south at a place known as Aphek, again, along the Via Maris, the way of the sea, the major highway of antiquity. And it's there that the forces have gathered in the days prior to what we just read. And it's important for us to note that because now we get to see what was going on in the background while all of these things were developing. And so this is what we read. I'm going to continue with verse 2. Go back to that map for just a second. We read, as the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Achish, the king of Gath. The commanders of the Philistines asked, what about these Hebrews? Achish replied, is this not David, who is an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He's already been with me for over a year, and from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault in him. What the author is doing is telling us about all the drama that is taking place before Saul goes to the medium at Ender. The Philistines have gathered at Aphek. Their army is moving up the coast and headed toward the Jezreel Valley. Units of hundreds and thousands are leading the way. And at the tail end of the column is the king of Gath, Achish, along with David and his men. David, who has become Achish's bodyguard. And as you read that, the tension is what's going to happen now? You know, is David going to fight against King Saul? Is David, who's been hiding out among the Philistines and, and really has been very shrewd in his dealings with them, is he going to be forced to fight his own people? What's going to happen? Well, we read this, verse 4. But the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish and said, send the man back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? By the way, those words are well chosen. David, who had taken the head of Goliath years earlier, now they're afraid he's going to take all of our heads. Well, verse 5. They go on, they say, isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And now Achish is confronted with a real issue. His own leaders are telling him, don't bring David along. And what we see here, if, if I may just say this, there is such incredible irony here. I, I, I'm going to express it this way. Saul thought David his mortal enemy, yet David was his most loyal subject. David had two opportunities to kill Saul and didn't because he would not strike the Lord's anointed. Achish, on the other hand, thought David was his most trusted subject, yet David was his most dangerous foe. David is a man of honor, of principle, and I might add, he is one smart dude. And so, we'll conclude here this morning with these words. Verse 6, So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you. Now, but the rulers don't approve of you. <laughs> now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done, asked David? What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Boy, those words are well chosen, aren't they? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? Now, to Achish, it sounds like he's talking about Achish. 
But in reality, he is Saul's most loyal subject. And so Achish answered, I know that you have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said he must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. And again, if we can show it on the map, at this point, as the Philistine captains and generals are saying, we don't want David with us, Achish tries to be very gracious with David and say, you know, you've been so good, I trust you, and so on, but you're going to have to go back. And with that, David and his men head back to Ziklag in the south, where they had been for well over a year. And the Philistine army moves up here to Shunem to face King Saul. And so now at the end of chapter 29, we come back to the events of chapter 28. This is very skillfully written and uh, it is, it's great history telling. And it sets us up now for what takes place next. And that's also where we need to stop because our time is up. So let's pray and uh, we'll pick up next week. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you are the God of the universe. You are the creator of all things, seen and unseen. May we see your glory, your mercy, your holiness, and your love. May we respond with repentance and faith. And may we also see the reality of the unseen, Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may stand strong against the forces of the enemy. Amen. Well, God bless you all. We'll see you same time, same place next week as we continue with our study of David, a man after God's own heart. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having you with us again next time. If you would like more information about Awake Us Now, go to awakeusnow.com.